Hello, welcome to Cisco Live Barcelona 2020. Uh, this is going to be a really interesting session that we're going to go through here. Uh, what we're going to be talking about in this session is Cisco Silicon, and we're going to talk specifically about ASICs that Cisco develops. What I hope to communicate in this session is the uh, importance of ASICs, how, how we develop them, how we uh, create them, why we create them the way we do, and the functionality that they provide. So I think this will hopefully be a really, really interesting session for you. Now, anybody who's ever seen me present before will know that somewhere in my presentations there's going to be a picture of a rocket or a high-performance aircraft. This particular rocket is a space launch system that NASA is developing. And the reason for that is because I tend to talk through things at a fairly fast rate, and that's why I put the hashtag high bit rate uh, on the bottom of my presentation. So by way of introduction, my name is Dave Zaks. I'm a director of innovation for the CX team within Cisco. I've been with Cisco about 20 years. Inside Cisco, we say we live in dog years. So if you're a little dog, that's five years per year. If you're a big dog, that's seven years per year. So on that basis, I've been with Cisco anywhere from 100 to 140 years uh, so far. You can see on the bottom of the slide here some of the things that I tend to focus on, uh, which are flexible hardware, fabric networks, assurance, and machine learning. Those are all the kind of the areas that I specialize in within the company. And today, specifically, we're going to talk a lot about flexible hardware and delve into that in some depth. Now, this is a quote that Chuck Robbins tweeted out. He tweets out from time to time, and I captured this one when Chuck treated, tweeted it because I happen to really agree with this, ne this sentiment the network's going to be more important than it's ever been because the network is really at the center of everything that we do in IT. Uh, everything connects to it, servers, uh, data centers, users, everything attaches through network, but I'm actually going to take the liberty of correcting Chuck because in my opinion, it's not so much about the network being more important than it's ever been. It's about innovation in the network being more important than it's ever been. And that's really kind of what I want to go through in the session, is talk about all the innovation that we're doing in silicon and that we're doing in ASICs. So most people have probably seen a stack like this, uh, talking about how we develop intent-based networking. And typically, a lot of times, we focus at the top of the stack, up here with the applications and APIs and domain controller, things like Cisco DNA Center. Uh, but what I'm actually going to do in this talk is focus at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, the ASIC, the silicon layer at the bottom that forms the basis of all the platforms and products. So why do we want to start there with ASICs? Well, ASICs really are the foundational component that everything else is based on top of, and the functionality provided by those ASICs really conditions what we can do with the platforms they're made out of and what we can do with the solutions that we make out of all the different platforms that we have. So here's a picture of David Geckler. You probably saw him at the keynote yesterday for Cisco Live. I took this picture a few years ago, and David is holding something in his hand there and pointing at it. And the thing that he's holding is one of these. It's a UADP chip. Effectively, this is a chip that forms the basis of the Catalyst 9000 product family, and before that, the Catalyst 3850 and 3650 platforms. So uh, that we're going to... Uh, one of the things we, we're going to talk about those chips, and one of the things we often see our executives saying is that ASICs really are a pillar of Cisco innovation. I think that's absolutely true, but I want to explore in this session why that is and how important they are. Because ASICs are a bit of a hidden gem in our portfolio. I don't think we talk about them enough. Now, interestingly, I have given out a few of these ASICs to people over time, and sometimes they're not so much a hidden gem. This is uh, an ASIC that I uh, gave this ASIC to a friend of ours, and she turned it into jewelry. She actually turned it into a, a necklace. And so that'd be one of my challenges is if I end up giving you an ASIC at some point, uh, see what you can do creatively with it to uh, actually uh, turn it into something that might be a piece of art. Um, so to really talk about ASICs, we have to have a common language about ASICs and how they're designed and how they're built. So I'm going to go through a, a short uh, period here where we're going to talk about ASICs and how they are designed and built, from kind of from definition to deployment. So when we start thinking about how we develop an ASIC, there's many, many things that go into it. We have to think about the state of the art of what's possible, uh, market transitions that are happening, technology trends, R&D, what are customers asking for, how much investment protection and backwards compatibility do we need to provide, what are our competitors doing? All those things get synthesized through marketing, and then marketing interfaces with engineering, and you can see that's a very much a two-way arrow, because marketing will ask for the moon, the sun, and the stars, and engineering will say, well, I can't give you the moon, I can give you the moon and the sun, but the stars are going to cost more money. There's a back and forth process, but at the end of it, what you end up producing is a specification for the chip and what it needs to do. After that, the code, the chip, actually starts off as code. Most people don't know that something that starts off as hardware 
like this is actually starts, off, starts its life as software. The chip gets written as code. There are two languages that are used in the industry commonly for this. One is Verilog and one is VHDL. Cisco uses Verilog. And essentially this, car, this, this chip right here, which contains about three billion transistors on it, uh, actually represents a couple of million lines of Verilog code. So the chip would get coded over a period of months, and then we'd run it through a process called synthesis. That code would essentially get compiled, but it wouldn't compile to an object code that would run on your laptop or your smartphone. It actually compiles to what we call a net list, and a net list is a file, maybe a gigabyte in size. That's what we would actually send out to the chip manufacturer to get the chip physically built. Now the chip itself is actually designed in pieces, and it has to go through a thing called floor planning and placement. You essentially design the chip in functional blocks, different areas on the chip, just kind of like designing rooms in a house. You'd have different rooms, different areas. This is a bit of an art as well as a science because you, uh, for the different functional blocks that are placed on a chip, we have electromagnetic interference effects between the different areas of the chip that have to be accounted for, but effectively we're connecting it up to power, we're limiting crosstalk, we're doing all the things that are necessary to get us to a functional chip design. After that comes the process that most people are probably most familiar with, which is actually etching the design onto a silicon wafer. So we start off with one of these. This is a raw ingot of silicon. This is what would go in one end of the factory. Effectively, you would have here a, 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 a chunk of the pure silicon material. You're going to then refine that down into an ultra-pure wafer, and onto that you're going to photo image the chips themselves. So we have a light source that would uh, effectively etch the chips onto this. Now, because of the uh, high density that we use for chips today, we don't actually etch that on using light anymore because the uh, wavelength of light is too coarse. We actually use ultraviolet, or today even extreme ultraviolet radiation, to actually etch the image onto that chip. And the chip is etched on with multiple layers as well, just like multiple layers in a circuit board. It's a very involved process. This is typically where you see the people in a clean room uh, running around. Now what we're really talking about here is transistors and how many transistors can I fit onto a silicon chip. Those transistors used to be discrete transistors, now the transistors are actually implemented with a technology called MOSFET, Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor. That is a phrase that you should take back and talk to your family about tonight uh, and quiz them on because that's just such a cool acronym. But effectively what this is is shrinking the transistor down to a very, very small size onto the die. And in fact, these are so small today that we actually use a technology called FinFET, where the transistor is spun on its side and we effectively build the transistors up in 3D to get greater packing density, kind of like moving from a single dwelling house into a high rise. Now, it's a little known fact, but the entire technology industry, not just networking, but everything in technology, is fundamentally based on two gate constructs, two circuit constructs called a NAND gate, a not AND gate, and a NOR gate, a not OR gate. These two gates have the interesting Boolean property that they can be combined into virtually any logic circuit. So effectively what we're doing is taking that code that was written, running it through a synthesis process and, and, and ultimately laying out a, a, a huge number of gates, millions and millions and millions of gates onto the silicon die, which ultimately is what we're going to produce the chips out of. When you see this silicon die, what you're looking at is many, many, many chips that are etched onto that and then the chips are all cut into pieces, packaged, and put into uh, this traditional silicon chip that, that you would see. So I mentioned at the beginning that I'm a bit of a space buff. So here's a bit of a fun fact. We put a man here, as long as you believe that we actually did put a man on the moon, and if you don't, we can have an interesting discussion later about that. Uh, but we put a man here on the moon using this thing called the Apollo Guidance Computer, and that computer was built from 4,100 individual integrated circuits each one of contain, which contained a single three input not or gate. So in other words, we put a man on the moon with less than 10,000 transistors, but today we take more than 19.2 billion transistors on the most advanced one of these chips uh, to uh, route your packets with the appropriate QoS and encryption and fragmentation and everything else that we do on that chip. So what we're really talking about here is transistors and how many transistors we can pack onto a silicon die. Now most people are probably pretty familiar with Moore's Law. Moore's law basically states that uh, every 18 to 24 months, the number of, chip, uh, number of transistors we can pack onto a chip will double. But of course, that's not a progression of 2, 4, 6, 8. That's a progression of 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and a runaway, uh, uh, runaway progression. 
So uh, it's really uh, the ever-shrinking transistor. We've gone from 65 nanometer to 45 nanometer to 32 or 28 nanometer or 22 nanometer. The current state of the art is seven nanometer chip manufacturing and probably will be at five nanometer chip manufacturing within about probably the next 12 to 18 months in production. So a lot of people have a challenge with understanding how small a nanometer or a billionth of a meter is. So maybe by, uh, some comparisons will help. A human hair is actually 100,000 nanometers in width. So if you take a look at an individual hair on your arm or on your head, what you're gonna see is something that's 100,000 nanometers wide. Maybe that gives you some idea of how small a nanometer is, but maybe we can draw another comparison too. If we took one of those hairs, cut it into cross section like this, so that's a cross section of a single human hair, and made that as tall as the Empire State Building in New York, uh, on that scale, a red blood cell would stretch up to about the 10th floor on that cell, a single red blood cell. A bacterium over here would stretch up to about the third floor. A piece of protein on that scale would be about the size of a small dog down here on the sidewalk. And then finally over here, we come to this little pinprick, which would be a size of three pennies stacked on top of each other. And next to that Empire State Building sized hair, those three pennies stacked together represent one nanometer. Now we build chips with transistors that are nanometer sized, like I mentioned, seven nanometer or 14 nanometer chips are very common today. And if you don't think this is magic that we can build things at this scale, then I don't know how to explain magic to you. Um, this is incredible technology that we use. So there's a whole process, as I mentioned, that we go through to design and develop chips. Typical timeline for a chip from an idea on a whiteboard to something that we're actually shipping out to the market is anywhere from two to five years. And the chip that I'm gonna talk about here a lot actually took us five years to design. So there's a lot that goes into building ASICs. There's a lot of time and treasure that's spent developing chips. And the first question you might ask is, why do we do it? Why do we go out and develop our own chips? Why doesn't Cisco just go out to the market and buy chips from merchant silicon vendors and base our products on that? And the answer is sometimes we do that. But only a very small percentage of what Cisco actually ships to the market is based on what we call merchant silicon. The vast majority of our products are use Cisco custom designed silicon for a bunch of reasons. One of those reasons would be something like simpler deployment options. So one of the things that we really, really would like to have is the ability to simplify network deployments. Most people are probably familiar with the Catalyst 6500 platform. Uh, the Catalyst 6500 has a really interesting deployment option called VSS, Virtual Switch System. And what, we, what we're able to do with VSS is to uh, take two Catalyst 6500s, link them together with a number of 10 gigabit interfaces and make them into a single switch, I'll have them operate as a single switch. Now in order to do that, you have to actually extend the black plane header the uh, packet would have when it goes into a switch. In other words, when a packet goes into a switch, there's a bunch of information about the packet that doesn't come in with the packet. These are things like, for example, uh, you know, which port did I come in on? Which port am I leaving on? What's my priority in crossing the switch fabric backplane? In order to link two switches together as one with a virtual switch system on a Catalyst 6500, we need to extend that backplane header between the switches. We have an ASIC, codenamed R2D4, that lives in the Catalyst 6500 supervisor module, which extends that backplane header for us. In other words, if I want the simpler deployment option, I need to have silicon support for it. Uh, another thing might be better insight and optimization. So for example, one of the things that we really place a lot of value on is understanding what's happening in our networks. And for that, we need to use a technology like NetFlow. Now if you think about what a switcher or a router normally does, if I'm a switcher or a router, a packet comes into me, I send it on to, a, figure out where it needs to go, send it along to its destination without reference to any packet that came before or any packet that's gonna come after. In other words, switches and routers normally operate statelessly. But there are a lot of uh, instances where I might want to have uh, stateful information re retained from the device. For example, maybe I'm tracking all the flows in the network from a security perspective, or I want to tr do traffic planning, traffic analysis. So I want to use NetFlow. Now, if you want to have, build NetFlow into a device, you need to build that in in the silicon. You can't add this later through software. And especially if we want a security application, I might to main, need to maintain NetFlow information on every single packet going through the network. In other words, I can't just use sampled NetFlow and look at one out of every 100 or one out of every 1,000 packets. That might be good enough for statistical analysis, 
but it wouldn't do me any good for a security application because there I need to be tracking every single flow. If you want full flow net flow in your ASIC, you have to design that in up front. And that's one of the reasons why we would take a look at that as a marketing requirement and then take that all, through, all the way through into the silicon design. We might want to increase security. We might want to be able to use more flexible security and things like Cisco TrustSec, for example. If I want to be able to understand TrustSec headers in packets, I need to build that in in silicon. We, of course, need to build it to the appropriate scalability for devices. Things are, di are different at the access layer than they're diff different in the core in terms of scale and table size. But probably the most important aspect of this is what I call flexibility and investment protection through programmability. And let me talk a little bit about that. So uh, when we think about how, when we put network devices into our deployments, we normally want those devices to, ask, to last for a period of time. Usually when I talk to customers about this, they will tell me that they want that switch to last five years or seven years or maybe even 10 years in a deployment. But think how much has changed in technology industry over the last five to 10 years. We're now seeing all these things come in with fabrics and integrated security requirements into networks. We're seeing encryption come in. We're seeing all these different requirements uh, come into a network environment. And what we need is the flexibility to adapt to these because when these new technologies come along, we want to be able to adopt them. We don't want to have to rip and replace big chunks of our network in order to get there. So the here's how a traditional networking ASIC works. Ours or anybody else's traditional non-flexible ASIC. You'd have a packet come into a port on an ASIC. So here's a representation of a packet coming into a port. Normally what would happen is that packet would come into the port on the switch. And when it goes into the switching ASIC, the first thing it would go into is a parser block. The job of the parser block over here is to figure out what is this packet. Is it IPv4? Is it IPv6? Is it MPLS? What is it? It's going to examine it. Remember we said the chip started as code? There's going to be code here that's now been turned into hardware, into silicon, that's going to examine that packet to figure out what it is. And that will handle a certain number of packet headers that it's pre-coded or pre-wired pre to do. Then the packet is going to move down a pipeline, and in that pipeline, it's going to reference some very fast memory tables, but the pipeline itself is going to be fixed. It's going to have layer two lookups, layer three lookups, ACL lookups, QoS lookups, and you know, the, the functionality of that pipeline, again, was uh, created not at the time you buy the product, but the time we designed it, which could have been years earlier than when you buy it. Now, it's going to go through an ingress pipeline. The packet's then going to go down an egress pipeline, assuming we didn't decide to drop it by reason of an ACL or something. The packet's going to go down an egress pipeline, go through a similar set of lookups on egress pipe. At the end of that, we're going to go through a rewriter block where we're going to rewrite the packet. So, for example, we might be rewriting the MAC address for next hop, decrementing TTL for next hop, and we're going to forward the packet out. Now, this is how any traditional networking ASIC works. They've worked this way for years, they're very fast, but the challenge is they're fixed function. If you want a set of capabilities that that chip doesn't do, then you're kind of out of luck. So for example, uh, right here, I have a chip. This is a chip called Aludra. This is the, uh, the heart of the Catalyst 6500, very, very popular switch platform, 6500 and 6800. This is a traditional fixed function ASIC. So this means that it can handle, for example, on that chip, IPv4, IPv6, MPLS, GRE in hardware, that's all great, but for example, it doesn't do VXLAN in hardware. If you want VXLAN, that particular chip is not capable of doing it in hardware because that protocol didn't exist when the chip was designed. So what can we do about this? How can we, how can we address this challenge that this uh, ASICs are fixed in nature and yet we want to keep devices in our network for a long period of time because the really, real innovation is moving from hardware to software in networks. So the challenge here is that if I have a fixed pipeline, packet comes along like VXLAN or something like that that the packet chip doesn't know how to handle, you'll get this dreaded not supported in hardware. Now what that means is at that point there's really only two things. If a packet comes along the, chip, the fixed chip is not designed to understand, there's really only two things the chip can do. It can either punt the packet to CPU, in which case we'll go from millions of packets per second to maybe a few thousand packets per second, so not very useful, or the chip can drop it. So those really are your only two options if you end up with protocols that aren't supported in traditional fixed chip hardware. But yet we see the network evolving. We see the evolution of the network to address things like fabrics, which are based on VXLAN and LISP and TrustSec and these different protocols, which we need to run end to end to create the intent-based networks that we want to have. So this is really where flexible ASICs come to, come to help us. The concept here is that a flexible ASIC is itself 
programmable. So different elements on the chip can be changed through software. What you would see as a new iOS version that you load onto a device and reboot the device, all of a sudden you get a whole new level of functionality, but you get it in hardware because what we've done is we've changed or updated the microcode on that chip in real time, and now you've got a whole new level of ASIC functionality, but you get it at hardware speeds. So this is really an incredible capability. So for example, if we take a look at how does a flexible chip differ from a fixed chip, the first thing you'd see over here is that we have a flexible parser. The, remember I talked about that parser block and the portion of the chip that figures out what the packet is when it comes in? Well, on a flexible chip, the parser block is itself programmable. So we can program that parser block to look at any different field in the header of the chip. For example, this chip, which is the heart of a Catalyst 9000 series switch, this particular chip, uh, it can look up to 256 bytes deep into the packet header. It can parse on and alter anything in those two first 256 bytes. That gives us the ability to handle almost any packet header out there that we know about. Uh, even maybe packet header formats that haven't been invented yet, we could reprogram the flexible parser to understand them. Then we take those fixed blocks, those formerly fixed blocks in the, in the ASIC pipeline, and turn those into flexible programmable blocks as well. So what we see is that every, every block here can take a look at and alter the packet individually. In this particular chip, the UADP chip, the Unified Access Data Plane chip that the, uh, the, the Catalyst 9000 is based on, we actually have a 17 stage ingress pipeline, an eight stage egress pipeline, so I have uh, 22 or 25 stages depending on the version of the chip that we can, and each stage that we can examine the packet with and each stage can do zero, one, or two lookups on the packet. So we literally have dozens of opportunities to examine and modify the packet as it moves down this flexible pipeline. At the end of the flexible pipeline, we also have what we call a flexible rewriter. So again, the portion of the, the chip that rewrites the packet, that changes the packet as the packet's getting routed through the device is itself programmable. So we can rewrite the, the packet in multiple different ways depending on what we need. So really what this gives us at the end of the day is complete flexibility in the forwarding pipeline, very, very different than a traditional fixed ASIC and much more flexible and capable. So if, for example, I can build a chip and these chips will handle IPv4, IPv6, MPLS, GRE, uh, you know, all these different functions, including things, more advanced functions like VXLAN, for example. Now VXLAN is an interesting one because VXLAN and GRE as well are tunneling protocols and really all the interesting things that we see happening in networking today are based around tunnels. So I'm gonna talk in a short bit about how the chip handles some of these protocols that are tunneled. But one of the key things here is the flexibility that this chip offers and a, a flexible chip like this offers. If we invented IPv7 tomorrow, and we hope the industry doesn't invent IPv7 because we've taken 20 years to adopt IPv6, but if the industry were to invent IPv7 tomorrow, we could probably handle it through this concept of the flexible programmable pipeline. Very, very powerful concept. Now I talked a little bit about tunneling and how uh, tunneling is required for certain protocols. So for example, let's say I took an IPv4 packet, spun it through the chip, and my forwarding decision was this needs to forward into a VXLAN tunnel. Maybe it's entering an, a fabric, like an SD access fabric, for example. So I'd take that IPv4 packet and I'd wrap it in a VXLAN header, but now the destination of the packet has changed because now it's going to the endpoint of the VXLAN tunnel and not the endpoint where the user originally sent it to. That means I need to take the packet for another spin through the chip. We highly optimize the chip for what we call recirculation in terms of bandwidth and performance. For example, in this UADP chip, I can recirculate a packet off the end of the egress pipeline back to the beginning of the ingress pipeline in less than 500 nanoseconds. So we have very, very high performance research path. In other words, I can recirculate the packet through this chip so quickly that you won't notice it. Now we could actually recirculate the packet up 16 times if we needed to. Uh, we don't have a need in this chip to recirculate it more than seven times with any use case we've currently come up with. But the recirculation is really key because all the innovation that's happening now in networking typically involves some sort of tunnel and requires recirculation. So the point here is really, it's very, very exciting and I hope I'm communicating the, the passion that I have for this to you about how with ASICs that are programmable, we have the capability to update via software the chip, but still operate the functions at hardware speed. I remember the first time I saw this within Cisco, sitting in the back of a building with a couple of hundred engineers 
in that building. And there was a lecturer at the front who was talking about this chip. This is probably about three years before we shipped the first version of the UADP chip in 2013. And this particular engineer uh, was a, a gentleman named Hiroshi Suzuki. He would develop a lot of QoS functions within the chip. And I would estimate on Hiroshi that this up here runs at about 200, 100 to 200 gigabits per second. This runs at about 25 gigabits per second, so there's a significant speed mismatch there. And as you can tell by his name, he's Japanese by, by origin. And so when he gets excited, it all kind of comes out with 16-bit encryption. So I remember sitting at the back of a room of a couple hundred engineers trying to keep up with 25 gigabits per second of 16-bit crypto. But when I understood what we had built in this flexible chip, my instinct as an engineer was to stand up and applaud. Because finally we built this piece of silicon that we could adapt to different functions over time. And it's just a, it's just a huge advance in what we're able to do. So you've seen this type of silicon come into our product line over time. You've seen this evolution from former platforms like a 3550 and 3750, if folks remember those platforms, that were based on fixed function ASICs, up to our latest generation of silicon, the UADP, which really came to market with the 3850 and 3650 platforms and is now the heart of everything that we build in the Catalyst 9000, right from the bottom of the, the range with the 9200 to the top of the range, and you can see that this is all Cisco developed silicon. So we've developed all of this in house and we reap all the benefits of what I would call vertical integration by doing so. And you can see that uh, you know, the, the, the very sophisticated chips, seven and a half billion transistors, or the latest one now is actually 19.2 billion transistors. These are among the densest pieces of silicon being developed anywhere in the world. So again, this is a family of chips. It's been an evolution from our initial platforms based on UADP 1.0 and 1.1 up to UADP 2.0 and 3.0, which really formed the basis now of the Catalyst 9K product line. And our latest version of this, because we don't always just make things bigger, we've actually gone smaller with a mini-me version of the UADP 2.0 mini, and this is actually what we base the Catalyst 9200 platforms on. So again, it's an evolution over time of all of these platforms. When we take a look at the core architecture of the chip, we see that we have on one side of it an ingress forwarding controller, talking to those high performance lookup tables, an egress looking forwarding controller. So this is kind of the block diagram of the chip, if you will. And when we zoom into that a little bit more, what you're gonna see is the individual processing stages inside. I mentioned that on the UADP 2.0 and 3.0, we have a 17 stage ingress programmable pipeline an eight stage egress programmable pipeline. You can see those blocks in there called IGR and EGR. These stand for ingress global resolution and egress global resolution. So these are the blocks that figure out what to do with the packet once all those stages have processed it because one stage could have said rewrite the QoS information in the DSCP value. Another stage might have said drop it because it matches an ACL. So those blocks figure out what to do with it at each stage. Again, we're running packet through this programmable pipeline in the highest end UADP 3.0 at over a billion packets per second. So that is just an incredible level of performance we're able to achieve here with all this flexibility and programmability. And as I mentioned, we also take this uh, downscale as well with something like a UADP 2.0 mini. The UADP 2.0 mini, we did something pretty interesting. We actually embedded the CPU into the ASIC as well. So we took ARM core CPUs and embedded those into the UADP ASIC, this helps to reduce the price point of the switch and gets this technology, this flexibility, down to an even lower price point so we can get it into more places in the network and you can deploy it in more places. Now we're not only doing innovation in uh, wired networking, we're also doing innovation in wireless as well. And we actually, Cisco actually has a long history of this. If you take a look at all the things we've introduced, clean air, hyperlocation, flexible radio assignment, intelligent capture, all the things we've done is we've continued to evolve our access point product line. One of the things I want to talk about here is a really interesting innovation that we come up with called the Cisco RF ASIC. And this is a, a cutaway version that I have here of an AP, uh, nine, uh, this is an AP9120. And uh, I'll draw your attention on here if I flip over to the back side of this to a little board up here, a little red board that you can see. And this little red board is actually called the Cisco RF ASIC. So what the RF ASIC is, is a, a, a custom piece of silicon that we built into the access point for doing processing of wireless traffic. So with this, we're able to do 
uh, many different things. For example, one of the things that we do in wireless is a thing called dynamic frequency selection, which means that we also have to automatically be looking at the channels that we're on and making sure that we avoid certain channels where other things may be present, like radar signals, for example. Now, normally in all our other access points, we would have done this in software only, meaning that we'd have to hop off channel in order to determine if we've got interference. Uh, here we can actually leverage hardware like the RF ASIC, which will allow us to do this uh, and increase the performance of the AP because we're able to do this in hardware. Again, here's a little close up of where this chip lives in some of our latest uh, access points like the 9120 and the 9130. Now we've built a lot of, as we typically do, we've built a lot of functionality into the silicon. We've only realized a fraction of this functionality in software so far. One of the things that we will be able to do as we go forward is turn on even more and more functions that we built into silicon with more and more features on the access point. That's one of the really cool things about building things in hardware is we can build in functionality. The software may not even leverage right away, but over time we're able to leverage more and more of that capability that we built into the silicon. So the RF ASIC is a really interesting addition into our wireless product line that gives us a, a really cool set of capabilities. Now, one of the things you probably heard about at the keynote yesterday, and you've heard Cisco talking about this for the last short while, is this new chip that we've developed called Cisco Silicon One. This is a, a new ASIC that we've developed, very high-end ASIC, that we're basing our Cisco 8000 router series on for service provider networks and for web scale networks, meaning things like massively scalable data centers, for example. So when you take a look at the Cisco Silicon One chip, and I put up there a URL where you can go watch a YouTube video, about this chip. There's a few things that I'll call to your attention here. The first one would be around performance. This particular piece of silicon can handle up to 10 terabits per second. That is an astonishing amount of, of, of uh, throughput. The highest throughput that we get through the UADP chip that I talked about earlier, uh, the highest end version of this is a 1.6 terabit chip. Here we are on the service provider side, we need to go to the next level of performance, and this is a 10 terabit chip. Now to put that in context, yeah, that would mean that if everybody, let's say, in the city of Vancouver, where I'm from, I'm from Canada, if everybody from the city of Vancouver was simultaneously streaming a high-definition Netflix video or, or a video off Prime, uh, what you'd see is that you know, if every single person, a couple million people in the city, was streaming a move, that high-definition movie simultaneously, all of that could go through a single one of these ASICs. So very, very high performance but also very key down here, you'll see on the bottom, programmable using a language called P4. P4 stands for Programming Protocol Independent Packet Processors. Again, that's a good acronym you should go home and quiz your family on tonight. Uh, this basically means that just like we talked about the programmability in the UADP chip, this ASIC as well uh, is also fully programmable and that's very, very exciting, again, for use in a service provider context, not just in an enterprise context as we'd see with the, the UADP and the ASIC. So lots of interesting stuff going on in silicon. But at the end of the day, we have to think, what does this all mean for me, right? What, what does this all, it's very, very cool that we talked about ASICs and I hope that, again, I've communicated some information, maybe a few things about ASICs you didn't know, uh, but also, my, hopefully I've communicated my passion for this. But at the end of the day, what does this all mean? And the real concept here that I think is very important is that our programmable hardware really provides for flexibility and adoptability. Flexibility to adapt to new protocols and new functions over time, which increases adoptability because now as, new as we create new things like software-defined access, you can actually adopt those in your network. Think about, for example, if you'd bought the first Catalyst 3850 switch off of the line in January 2013, you would still be able to use, we didn't ship software-defined access as a solution until 2017, over four and a half years later. But if you bought the first Catalyst 3850 in 2013, you would be able to use software-defined access on it with VXLAN encapsulation and, and uh, SGT tagging at Cisco TrustSec four and a half years later. That's what I mean by adoptability. We develop a new solution, we come up with a new solution, and you're able to adopt that and use that in your network. That's why this is really key on this concept of going to intent-based networking, is because this allows us to effectively create new solutions, which we can roll out in software, which you can then adopt into your network and operate at hardware speeds. So that's what I mean by the focus of innovation, 
moving from software or from hardware to software, we've built a flexible hardware base that now we can support innovation at the speed of software on top of it. So ASICs really form a critical role here, this critical role of flexibility in silicon because ASICs are the foundations for products, which ultimately are the foundations for solutions, which also ultimately is what provides benefits in our networks. It all starts with that ASIC silicon at the bottom because that is really providing the, the, the strong foundation on which the products and the solutions are based. Just like the foundation for a building, this provides a strong foundation on which all of our solutions build. That's why ASICs are so key and why you constantly hear our, our uh, executives talking about the importance of ASICs and the importance of, of silicon. This is why it's so important. Now, if you want to know more about ASICs, I actually uh, teach a course here at Cisco Live with my compatriot, Peter Jones. We teach a course called Cisco Silicon, the importance of hardware in a software-defined world. It's actually happening tomorrow morning. And we subtitle that session from the gates to the GUI. Because what we do in that session is we really move from the gates, silicon gates, remember we started off talking about those, up to all the benefits that we drive through our GUI-based architectures that we have today. So with that, I will wrap up the session. Uh, thank you for attending. I really hope you enjoy your time at Cisco Live and all the different sessions and information that's made available to you here. And uh, I look forward to talking to you more about ASICs in future.